everyone, I'm Muni Rose, Junior President of the School Broadcasting Network and welcome to the national launch of An Antichinus in the Attic, a curious tale by Viana Nashon with stunning illustrations by Mike Mollard. With an inspiring call to action forward by Dr Jane Goodall herself, this A to Z of endangered, rare and iconic Australian species is also a conservation awareness and action campaign for children that goes way beyond the pages of this beautiful picture book. Proudly brought to you by the School Broadcasting Network, publishers of An Antichinus in the Attic, and the Jane Goodall Institute in partnership with Roots and Shoots Australia, this week-long launch event is the biggest global collaboration for National Threatened Species Day in Australia today. We have 25 organisations including 18 zoos and wildlife parks and sanctuaries across every state in Australia and 25 storytellers from across every single continent in the world, including Antarctica, coming together throughout the whole week to inspire and motivate young people to take positive action to ensure that we do not lose any more of our precious wildlife. I'm now delighted to welcome Graz Van Egmond, CEO of the Banksy Foundation, to give the opening remarks. The Banksy Foundation is proud to be supporting this launch. We were established over 30 years ago to honour and celebrate change makers and leaders in sustainability across Australia. Over the 22 years that I have been at Banksia, I've seen some real pioneers, some real innovators, leaders and amazingly passionate individuals that are working on every aspect of sustainability to achieve the targets of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Let me assure you that we are doing it and we are getting there. And we need to keep in mind that creating a better world for mankind and our precious natural environment is possible. And there are some fantastic people out there actually making it happen. An anti kindness in the attic will enchant our next generation with wonderment for all these curious creatures that we are, that are so unique, many that are not found anywhere else in the world. And once you love something, then it is only natural that you want to protect it. And congratulations to Vian and the team for producing such a valuable picture book that I know will lead to children learning and understanding our creatures in a whole new way. There are so many successful recovery programs that are bringing species back from the brink. With so many organisations and dedicated people involved around the world, we know that our amazing creatures are in good hands. But it needs for each and every one of us as a community to ensure that we learn about these curious creatures and know how to protect them. Community empowerment is what makes things happen and I have seen this time and time and time again through the Banksy Awards. And what better way in empowering our future community leaders than through this wonderful initiative. Now it is with great pleasure I introduce our opening keynote speaker, Australia's Threatened Species Commissioner, Dr. Sally Box. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sally Box, the Australian Government's Threatened Species Commissioner. I'm really thrilled to help launch an Antichinus in an Attic, which is a new A to Z book of Australian flora and fauna, which includes many threatened Australian species, such as the Betty the Beton, Ethan the Eastern Curlew, and Helen the Helmeted Honey Eater. It's a really wonderful way for young people to learn about Australia's remarkable biodiversity and threatened species. As you read the book, you might come across species you've never heard of before. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of the threatened giant pink slug that's only found on the top of an extinct volcano in New South Wales. Or the dinosaur ant, a rare ant species found only in old growth Mallee woodlands in South Australia. Learning about threatened species is the first step in helping to protect them and hopefully you might be inspired to get involved in their protection. Conservation I think is everyone's business and there are heaps of ways that Australians including young Australians can get involved in protecting threatened species including by planting native plants in your school or in your backyard by getting involved in citizen science projects and recording things in your backyard or by being a responsible pet owner. When reading the book, if you look closely, you might spot some threatened plants, um, including the critically endangered Banksia vincentia. Banksia vincentia is Australia's rarest Banksia and it was first discovered more than a decade ago near the town of Vincentia in New South Wales. Only 14 plants were found, and then a deadly mixture of bushfire and disease re reduced the population to just four. 
This resulted in the Banksia vincentia being one of 30 plants listed as a priority species for recovery under the Threatened Species Strategy. Thanks to the Threatened Species Strategy and the dedicated work of many organisations and individuals, the Banksia vincentia is making a comeback. At the Australian National Botanic Gardens, the Australian Government has funded what's called an insurance population, where we're growing 45 plants that grow above the ground in their own special containers. By having them above the ground, it gives them a better chance of survival and, and helps to counter possible threats such as pests and soil-borne disease and poor drainage. At Buttery National Park on the New South Wales south coast, a seed orchard has been grown for the Banksia vincentia. The idea here is to grow plants for seed so that we can eventually plant Banksia vincentia back into the wild. So they've established about 1,200 plants and they're hoping to have 800 that they can use to secure the survival of the species in the wild. But Banksia vincentia is only one of many threatened plants in Australia. More than 90% of Australia's plants occur nowhere else on earth, so it's really important that we look after them and protect them. Plants also make up the greatest percentage of Australia's threatened species. Of the 1,800 threatened species that we have on our national list, around 1,300 of them are plants. So under our threatened species strategy, we've got targets and actions to help in the recovery of Australia's threatened plants. And while there's some really big challenges, we're seeing some really great results for our threatened plants due to the work of really passionate individuals right across the country. Actions to help Australia's plants include seed banking, so protecting the seeds so that if we lose them from the wild, we can plant them back into nature when we need them. Translocations, which is about moving plants from one place to another, or using seed orchards to help grow plants so that we can bring them back into the wild. You can also help Australia's threatened plants by planting them in your garden. I've got a lemon sea area in my garden and it's doing really well and attracting lots of native birds. This week marks Threatened Species Day, a day to reflect on our species that are at risk of extinction and to think about what we all need to do together to protect our threatened species. It's fantastic that an antichinus in the attic is being launched uh, this week to mark Threatened Species Day. It's a really wonderful example of raising awareness about Australia's remarkable flora and fauna and congratulations to all of you who are involved. G'day everyone, it's Jess here from the Jane Goodall Institute of Australia. Thank you so much Sally for that fantastic opening address. It's just so good to know that the Australian Threatened Species Commissioner and her team are doing such important work and making so much progress towards safeguarding our threatened Australian wildlife into the future. Now throughout these three episodes, you're going to meet so many different kinds of Australian wildlife, some of which you may never have even heard before. Now while these animals may look cute and cuddly, like my gorgeous puppy Winnie here, it's important to keep in mind that they are in fact wild animals. The Jane Goodall Institute and the School Broadcasting Network does not endorse the handling or being in close proximity to wildlife by any persons other than qualified professionals, such as the carers, keepers and the scientists who are featured in these videos who each comply with Australian standards of wildlife care. Now it's time to cross over to Dr Andrew Baker from the Queensland University of Technology who's going to introduce you to the star of our show today, that's Annie the Antichinus. An Antichinus is a small native marsupial. Um, there's about 15 different species of Antichinus and a couple of them are listed as endangered. Those two species that are part of this project are the silver-headed Antichinus and the black-tailed dusky Antichinus. We've only discovered these species in the last four or five years, so they're pretty new to science. These tiny animals live in forests on mountain ranges, which are cool and damp places. Climate change is making these areas warmer and drier, which can be a problem for the Antichinuses. The black-tailed dusky Antichinus used to live at some places that were lower down on the mountains. But as these places got warmer, scientists could not find them there anymore. Now, they are only found in the highest areas which are cooler and wetter. But the animals can't keep moving up. 
as they are already living on the top of their mountain ranges. The mountain ranges where these animals live are big places. Park rangers want to know where the animals are on the mountains in case these areas need special care. To work this out, in the different areas, the scientists have been putting out special metal box traps called Elliot traps to try to catch some. The traps don't hurt the animals. They are also using special cameras that automatically take a picture when an animal moves in front of them. But because these animals are very rare and good at hiding, it is hard to find the animals even with these methods. They needed an even better way to find out if the animals are at a site. So the scientists asked for help from another animal with a very special nose. Ash loves working in the bush. It's his favourite thing to do. Through his special training, Ash has uh, been taught to identify the silver-headed antichinus from other types of antichinus. We use a number of special training techniques to show him what they are Johnny. and how to look for them. When he's moving through the bush and he finds the antichinus for us, okay. he shows us a special behaviour, which for this dog is to lie down and put his nose right on the spot where he thinks the antichinus is. Okay. We use a special word, which is Y-E-S, once he's heard that word, we'll throw his favourite toy in the whole world. The silver-headed antichinus and black-tailed dusky antichinus are fascinating Australian animals. By working together, this team of scientists, national park rangers, detection dogs and their handlers are helping to care for these rare species and their mountain homes. Hey everyone, it's Isaac Wildlife Ray here from Victoria. Thank you so much, Andrew. And how cool was it to find out about Annie and Archie, the Antikinus, and those incredible sniffer dogs? How cool would it be to have more dogs be trained to work in conservation too? Now, I am super excited to say that we are just about to cross over to Megan and Bridie at Tasmania Zoo to learn about one of my most all-time favorite animals, Tommy the Tasmanian Devil. Plus, we'll learn a bit more about Theo the thylacine, who unfortunately passed away just over 80 years ago. So let's cross over to Megan and Bridie at Tasmanian Zoo. Hi guys, my name's Megan and I look after a large number of native wildlife like dingoes, Tasmanian devils, wombats and koalas here at Tasmania Zoo, which is just out from Launceston. Maybe if things were different, we could have had Tasmanian tigers here as well. Tasmania Zoo is involved in a number of breeding programs to help conservation efforts. One that is particularly close to our hearts here is the Tasmanian Devil. We don't want the Tasmanian Devil to go extinct like Theo, the Tasmanian Tiger and his cousin. It was believed that the Tasmanian Tiger liked to live in eucalyptus forests and woodlands. They used to prey on small mammals and birds and maybe even sheep. But little research was done into the eating habits of the Tasmanian Tiger. Maybe Tommy the Tasmanian Devil and Theo the Tasmanian Tiger might have said hi when passing through their territories. Like most of our Australian wildlife, Tasmanian Tigers were also marsupials. That means that the females had pouches and carried their young in there, just like the koala or wombat. Even though Tasmanian Tigers are called Tasmanian Tigers, they were also found on mainland Australia. There are even fossils found in Western Australia. They were extinct on the mainland 2,000 years ago. Sadly, the last captive Tasmanian tiger died on this day 84 years ago. That's why National Threatened Species Day is held on the 7th of September every year. You can help other Australian wildlife from going extinct by getting involved with National Threatened Species Day. 
Hey everyone, my name is Bridie. I am a carnival keeper here at Tasmania Zoo. Being a carnival keeper, I work with a range of animals from lions, tigers, to my absolute favorite here, the Tasmanian devil. So here at Tasmania Zoo, we are located at the northern part of the state, and we are a part of a fair few breeding programs, including the Tasmanian devil breeding program, which has completed now, and we have had a successful year of 14 young born here. So here I have Tommy's cousin, Quinn. She was born here at the zoo, and she is about five Five months old. She is weighing in at about 500 grams, which at the moment is quite small, but she'll get up to an average of about six to seven kilos. Tommy the Tasmanian Devil, however, he will get a lot bigger at about 10 kilos. Here on Tommy's page in the book, we can see a tennis tournament going on uh, with a few other animals. I believe Tommy will definitely win this tournament because he does have a really good grip. Tasmanian Devils have really good hands to be able to grasp onto objects not only to be able to keep themselves safe when they're riding on mum's back uh, but to also climb trees when they're younger out in the wild to get away from danger they also use this grass to be, to be able to hold onto their meat tasmanian devils being scavengers out in the wild they do mainly find their food out on the road this unfortunately puts them at a high risk of being hit by a car themselves out in the wild they are also declining due to devil facial tumor disease in the last 20 years it's expected that we have lost 85 percent of the population so here at Tasmania Zoo, we do dedicate our time for the uh, captive breeding program for devils, and some of these devils do go into programs for release. So our devils here, what you see behind me is pretty much what you'll see them out in the wild. So living in shrubbery, uh, underneath the tussocks there, and also in unused wombat burrows. September 7th, 84 years ago, we lost the last living Tasmanian tiger. We don't want to see the Tasmanian devils go the same way, or our other native wildlife either. So Threatened Species Day is to commemorate the animals that we have already lost, uh, but to also raise awareness for the animals that are declining out in the wild. So what you can do at home, go and support your local zoo, have a chat to the keepers to see what they're doing in their area to save their wildlife and to see how you can get involved and to save your wildlife as well. Thanks for joining myself and Quinn here at Tasmania Zoo. Now back to the team at JGI and the School Broadcasting Network. Hey, I'm Evie from SBN's team in Melbourne and I have my very own Tassie Devil called Tommy. Thanks to Megan and Bridie for all the great information about Tommy and Theo. Now we are heading from down south in Tasmania up to the tropics of Queensland to visit the team at Tree Roo Rescue. So can you guess what's coming up? We can guarantee this is going to be awesome. Okay, thanks team. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Karen and I'm at Tree Roo Rescue and Conservation Centre up on the Atherton Tablelands in far north Queensland. Now, if you can't tell by the name, we actually rescue tree kangaroos. And yes, we have Australian tree kangaroos. Isn't that exciting? Now, I'm very excited to be involved in this wonderful book called uh, Antichinus in the Attic. And I hope all of you enjoy it. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the really special characters in it. So we actually have a tree kangaroo in the, in the book. And it's Kirsty the tree kangaroo. And we have... Kenny the koala, who's, his, who's her friend, and Katie the kookaburra. Now in this picture, they're all in the kitchen and they're cooking um, kale and coal Robbie, and it's a big party, so they're having fun. But in real life, you wouldn't have a koala in the kitchen with a, with a tree kangaroo because they sadly don't live in the same area. So tree kangaroos live in only in far north Queensland and then in Papua New Guinea and they, don't, they live in rainforest and koalas live in eucalypt forest but wouldn't that be cool if we could have a party with them all and the kookaburra of course is around here so they could be together and you would find a, a tree kangaroo in the kitchen in our house so nowhere else though normally i would really love to take this opportunity to introduce you to kirsty's cousins and we have some real life tree kangaroos to introduce you to today so let's go Okay, hi, this is Misty and this is BJ. So these are Lumholtz tree kangaroos and they're found only in far north Queensland, mostly on the Atherton Tablelands in rainforest. So one of the problems is, is that 100 years ago, their habitat was nearly all continuous forest in the Southern Tablelands and we cleared it for timber and for farming. So we've left these tiny little patches where these guys need to live and it's surrounded by paddocks and sadly, they will come to the ground to go from paddock, from fragment to fragment, which makes them vulnerable to cars and to domestic dogs as well as wild dogs. BJ's gone to sleep. 
you think Kirsty would be having fun with these guys right now? And I've got one playing on my leg too. Do you want to come up, come up as well? So tree kangaroos also, sadly, because of climate change, we've also had another mysterious illness that's causing blindness in them, which we're researching. Um, and it's an unknown cause at this stage. Do you want to come in? Oh, thanks, Misty. So you say hello to all the people out there. So Misty, um, she was actually found in a mum's pouch and a young lad asked his mother to pull up and check the pouch. So, hey kids, if you see anything on the side of the road or everybody, not just kids, any animal on the side of the road that's um, been hit, please check its pouch because Misty would have died. She was only a tiny little thing and look at her now, huh? And she will be released back into the wild one day. Hey, Misty. Yes, you're a beautiful girl. Thank you. Yeah. BJ's just sitting asleep, but I want to introduce you to a couple of the features that tree kangaroos, some fun facts. So they're rainforest animals and they live in trees and he's a sleepy boy. They're not all friendly like this, so don't think you'll go into the wild and cuddle a tree kangaroo. Um, but they live up in trees so they, and they eat leaves. So they're what they call arboreal folivores. And to be able to, con they are a macropod, a kangaroo in every single way, except that they're, they're designed or adapted to climb trees. So you can see Misty's arms are very, very muscly and she has very large claws on them. And that helps her climb. And the same with their back legs. If Misty, can I show? Misty, let go, thank you. Their back legs are shorter and stockier than other kangaroos. And they have these awesome, dirty, padded feet. So you can see that? And that helps them climb. And they can move those back feet inwards so that they can go up and down tree trunks and long branches. So these big claws and big arms and this massive big long tail. Now this is for balance. They don't twist it around branches like possums, but they use it for balance. So when they lean out, they use that as a counterbalance. So, <laughs> Peter, you're funny. The other thing that's kind of interesting is they have these little whorls in their back and the fur goes forward from there and backwards from there. And then they have this little tiny fringe. And when it rains, tree kangaroos can put their head down. You're not gonna do it now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. And they put their head down and the rain runs off their little heads. Isn't that cute? Um, they have lots of other um, adaptations to climbing, but one of the things they can do is walk. Now I'm gonna see if I can get Misty to walk for you because it's fairly, it's really awesome. No other kangaroo can walk. They can move their legs, but not like these guys can. Now are you going to walk for us? You come here. Misty walk. Come on, baby. Come on, walk for me. Come on. Oh, you're gonna hop instead. There we go. So they can actually move their back legs independently like us. And, okay, <laughs> so how can you help? Well, these guys actually, um, we're the only rescue centre in Australia because these guys live up here. Um, and you can help by doing lots of things. So be kind to the environment, recycle, anything that you can do to help wild animals in Australia, including these guys. If you live down south, you can help koalas by planting gum trees, or you can plant tree, tree kangaroo rainforest trees if you live up this way or even get the school to sponsor a tree kangaroo we have adoption um, through tree Re rescue and there's all sorts of things always check pouches um, slow down when you're driving past areas where their tree roots are these guys aren't nocturnal they're active day and night so you need to be careful for with them keep your dogs locked in for koalas and tree kangaroos it's very important that they don't run free and um, cause these guys injuries. So, um, yeah, I guess that's it for now. And I'd like to thank you all for paying an interest in these guys and tell all your friends and family all about them because most Australians don't know about tree kangaroos. And I think I'll pass it back to the team now. So thank you and thanks guys, see ya. Hi. I'm Luke Eden, SBN's Youth Ambassador, and how exciting is this massive collaboration to inspire more awareness and action for our precious Australian species? 
Remember, there are heaps of things that you can do to help our threatened species, like Kirsty the Kangaroo. You can arrange a gold coin day at school to raise funds or volunteer at your local conservation organisation. You can also do, create some habitat in your own backyard or simply spread more awareness about these amazing animals by talking with family and friends about some of the issues that the animals are facing. And simply, by purchasing a copy of An Antichrist in the Attic, you are also raising funds for Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots Australia and the School Broadcasting Networks to assist these charities to expand their important conservation and use projects. And during this launch event, any orders you place via your favourite conservation organisation, a portion of the sale will go directly to these organisations. How cool is that? Check out the details down below. Now, we certainly do have some very curious creatures featuring an antichinus in the attic. We are about to discover one of the most curious of all. Poppy the giant bright pink slug from Mount Captar. So it's over to Adam Fawcett in New South Wales and to find out all about this very colourful and curious creature. Check this out. G'day, my name is Adam Fawcett and I'm a Senior Project Officer with the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service working on the Saving Our Species program within northwestern New South Wales and I am very familiar with Poppy the Pink Slug. Poppy is a giant pink slug from the Mount Capitar National Park which is located about seven hours northwest of Sydney near the township of Narrabri. The giant pink slug is one of the species that make up the Mount Capitar land snail and slug threatened ecological community, along with about 20 species of snails that are only found in Mount Capitar National Park and the surrounding Nandewal Ranges. The pink slugs are found on the high mountaintops, 1,000 metres above sea level, and are commonly seen during and after rainfall or on foggy or misty days and nights. The pink slugs and snails are threatened by being eaten by feral pigs, which also disturb and destroy their habitat, browsing by feral goats that destroy the forest and dry rainforest that they depend on, climate change and also wildfires. To protect the pink slugs and the snails, we have been doing lots of surveys to understand more about these incredible species. We're also doing work to control the feral pigs and the goats and also managing wildfire across the reserve. We did have a big wildfire at Mount Capitar in the last 12 months and our monitoring has found that all of the species are still present, including the Capitar bristle or hairy snail, the two carnivorous snails, the pinwheel snails, the glass snails and the giant pink slug itself. All of these species are recovering well after the fires, which is just fantastic to see. What you can do to help us managing the giant pink slug is to come out and visit Mount Capitar National Park to go camping and bushwalking. While you are there, you or your parents can download a free app available on both Apple and Android smartphones called the Slug Sleuth. Any sightings you see of the giant pink slug can be recorded using the Slug Sleuth app. A photo can be snapped in the app and then all of these can be submitted to us. When you submit these sightings, they get sent to our database and are used to help us better understand where the giant pink slugs are seen so that we can prove our management of all the things that threaten Poppy and her mates. Because the slugs, like Poppy, are so brightly coloured, they are really easy to see when they're out and about. But they don't like being out on really cold days or nights or on really sunny days. It's just not good for them. However, they do leave us their tracks, which are commonly seen on the bark of the gum trees across the mountaintops. And these show us where they have been, and they're a really important thing to see. There are photos in the Slugsooth app that show us what these tracks look like so that you can identify these and then record them in the app the same as you would as if you were seeing a slug itself. Both types of sightings are just as important. So that's it from us at the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. From Poppy and back to the team at JGI and the SBN. Hi, I'm Sarah from SBN Sydney team and check out the view. How stunning is Poppy the Pink Slug? Wow, I really want to download that Slug Sleep app now and head to Mount Capita to see if I can find any of these curious creatures. Now, we're crossing from Mount Capita in New South Wales all the way to the top of Australia as we're heading to the fabulous Territory Wildlife Park in Darwin to find out about Franco, the frilled neck lizard, and Ozzy the osprey. So, we're off to the Northern Territory. Hi and welcome to the Territory Wildlife Park. My name's Natasha, I'm one of the guides here at the park. I'd like to introduce you to Franco the frilled neck lizard. 
from Antichinus in the attic. We're just waiting for Fred and Fran, the flying foxes, to go and play some frisbee. So frill neck lizards are found in the tropics of Australia, the northern parts here. They uh, live in around savannah woodlands and grasslands. Uh, they love to live in the trees as well. So they'll come down to the ground and eat lots of insects when they see them crawling around. So frill neck lizards have declined from their range and it's due to things such as their reduction in their habitat, but potentially from cane toads being introduced as well. We have toad bus here at the park. You can come along and join in. Uh, that's helped to reduce their population numbers, which will help protect our frill neck lizards. Good morning, my name's Jess. We're here at the Territory Wildlife Park. We work down here at the flight deck where we do presentations and train the birds so that people get to appreciate them up nice and close. <laughs> and hopefully that leads to a bit of conservation of these beautiful species. Today I have Ozzy the Osprey coming to you from Antichinus in the attic. Well, we're not going to be here for very long because Ozzy's just about to get ready to go and play with Octavia and their oboes. Ospreys are such an interesting species. They're actually a fishing raptor, so they catch fish. Now, they locate them by using their polarised vision, so it's kind of like they're wearing sunglasses. They've got fish hooks for talons, and when they dive into the water, they grab hold of that fish using those fish hooks. Osprey love to go fishing, so that means that in the wild they're found all the way around Australia and in large areas of water where there's lots of fish. So the way that we can help wild osprey is by um, maybe getting mum and dad to look at more sustainable options when it comes to buying fish for dinner so that osprey in the wild can still have fish for dinner themselves. Well, that's it from us because Ozzy's ready to go and have a play with Octavia. So back to you team at JGI and the School Broadcasting Network. A huge thank you to the Territory Wildlife Park in Darwin for that fantastic episode on Franco the Frill Mac Lizard and Ozzy the Osprey. For our final presentation in today's episode, we're going to travel across to Brisbane, Queensland to the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, Australia's largest and oldest koala sanctuary. So you might be able to guess which curious creature we're going to meet next. Hi there, I'm Kelly. I'm a koala keeper here at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary and I've worked here for 14 years. Now I've been lucky enough to work with all sorts of different animals here at Lone Pine in that 14 years, but my favorites would have to be the koalas. In the book, Kirsty the kangaroo, Kenny the koala and Katie the kookaburra were cooking up some kale. Now let's see what Kenny's doing today. Here's Kenny now. He's sleeping. He's definitely not cooking any kale. Do you know how long koalas sleep for? They sleep for between 18 and 20 hours every day. Do you sleep that long? I definitely don't. In the book, Kenny's cooking kale, but did you know that koalas actually eat eucalyptus leaves? They eat between 50 and 60 different types of eucalyptus, but they have their favorites, just like I have favorite ice cream. My favorite is strawberry. What's yours? Sometimes koalas have to cross the road to find a new flavor of eucalyptus. So if you see a koala sign, slow down. Maybe you might even spot the koalas having a nap up in the trees. Hi guys, my name's Kayla and I'm an education officer here at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. I've worked at Lone Pine for about six years and I really love working in education because I get to work with all sorts of different, different awesome animals and I also get to work with a lot of really interesting people and I get to work with kids a lot and teach them all the things that I love about wildlife. Uh, one of the really cool animals that I get to work with is a rainbow lorikeet and check it out in the book here we've got Rachel the rainbow lorikeet and it looks like she's up reading a book about reptiles with Ricky the rabbit rat. 
Uh, they look like they're having a good time reading, except there's someone on the roof. It looks like Robert the Rock Wallaby is stomping on the roof, hopefully not making too much noise. Now, we've actually got Rachel the Rainbow Lorikeet to say hello to you all now. Where is she anyway? I know she was right around here. Where did she go? Rachel! There she is! So here's Rachel the Rainbow Lorikeet. Say hi, Rachel. She's waving hello. So, she's called a rainbow lorikeet because, well, looks like she's flown through a rainbow. She's got um, beautiful green feathers on her back, blue on her head, and then beautiful yellow and orange underneath. Now, rainbow lorikeets love to drink nectar, and that's what I'm feeding her a bit of today. Um, so when she does the right thing, when she does a good job, she gets a little treat of some nectar mix. Now, you can attract lorikeets like Rachel to your own gardens at home by planting plenty of these. Oh, she's very keen. So these are some native flowers called grevelias, and lorikeets love them. So she's using her little tongue right now to scoop them up, and lorikeets can even drink nectar hanging upside down. She's quite a good acrobat. So by planting native flowers in your garden, you won't just attract birds like Rachel the Rainbow Lorikeet, you might also get Brianna the Blue Banded Bee, or even Fran and Fred the Flying Foxes to come and visit your garden, because heaps of animals like nectar and like to be around flowers. Well, we might say goodbye from the team here at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary and send it back to everyone over at JGI and the School Broadcasting Network. Bye everyone! Hi, I'm Nathaniel Dion, Chairman of SBN's International Young Leaders Board. We hope you've enjoyed learning about all of these amazing and curious creatures, from Annie the Antichinus to Poppy the Pink Slug and Kenny the Koala. We'd like to give a huge thank you to our special keynote speaker, Dr. Sally Box, Australian Threatened Species Commissioner, for sharing her passionate knowledge about our unique and very special flora, and to all the wildlife experts who have given you a glimpse to some of the lives of Australia's unique wildlife. Check out episode two, coming up next, featuring some of our most endangered species, such as the Corroboree Frog, Helmeted Honey Eater, Mountain Pitchme Possum, and the Lord Howe Island Stick Insect, which was thought to be extinct until just a few years ago. Plus, we are so honored to welcome keynote speaker, Ian Redmond, OBE, chairman of the Ape Alliance and co-founder of the exciting new global documentary. EcoStreams. We'll see you soon in episode two.